everyone. Um, thank you, Shamrit, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, so my name is Fatma, and I'm um, a painter. I made a few works lately. Yeah, yeah. Point okay. I uh, made three artworks, video works lately, but I won't show it now because we, we have only 15 minutes, I think. Yeah. Um, I will start with this painting um, and maybe talk about the carpet because you can see that the carpet appears almost in uh, all of my works. And I started to use the carpet in my work uh, about eight years ago from the beginning. Um, from a geographic place, because for me the carpet represents my community as a Jew. Um, and I, I, I can say that the carpet um, became like more than object, it became even a member of my family, in my experience, my own experience. Um, there's my father, my mother, <coughs> my sister, my brothers, and there's the carpet. Um, and I was trying to any light, like the presence of the carpet, um, by putting outside, outdoors, taking the carpet to the field or to the village or to the other public spaces. And bringing myself or the woman um, to the canvas. Like, uh, it's sort of, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, I was trying to switch between the presence of the carpet and the presence of, of me as a woman. And from, um, you can say from which perspective, so it's, <laughs> I think it's, uh, from a feminist per perspective because being uh, or living in a Druze community um, um, it says like you can't act your life as an individual you're always part of the community, part of the larger place and I'm trying to ask questions about the place of the individual in the, from this point and in general um, yeah, you know, for me the carpet is also a place or a territory or a, um, yeah, that I can carry, I can put, I can place in other place, I can, um, I, I think, um, I can show you, um, yeah, those works. It's it's pretty different because you can see here a landscape. It's, I think that the carpet here became a landscape, uh, especially in the work with um, with that carpet related to the 18th century. It's an Iranian carpet. Um, I'm here, like, ask questions about the connection or the relationship between the mental restrictions and the physical restrictions because I think that mental restrictions affect on the physical restrictions of the body and like um, Lyotard asks questions or a question of if like um, a thoughts can go on without the body so the connection with the mind or the and the body is very uh, like there is an, an interaction between um, and here I'm trying to use this is a self portrait and this is my niece here so um, in the book in that painting I'm trying to use my body and using the physicality of my body and the flexibility of my body in order, it's like a metaphor of the relationship between the mental and the physical. Um, I think I'm here a bit influenced by um, artists like Marina Abramovich or Sigalit Landau and that they involve their body in order to examine 
the limits of the body. is also um, yeah here we can you know, we can see a, a painting with a carpet outside and I can talk here about like Foucault talked about the hydrotopic place that like here by doing the act of taking the carpet outside and trying to um, think and doing some subversive action towards the community or towards the place that I took the carpet from. Um, It's a different. Um, I, I worked here in a very um, different way, um, using the, the brush with um, in a different way. Um, and you, you, if you look at like the paintings that I um, painted at the beginning and the pain paintings that I painted lately, you can see that. Um, there is some <coughs> there is some um, changes some um, that the the painting became more abstract actually if you can look at it closer uh, you can see that it's uh, really uh, it's figurative but <coughs> it's also abstract um, I think I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So I'd like to invite all of the panelists up. Much like when we are told not to look at the trash in the foreground of a landscape, or when a police officer tells us, move on, there's nothing to see here. All of these presenters today, through their scholarship or their artwork, or both, utilize a critical way of seeing. What W.J.T. Mitchell, our keynote speaker, describes as an act of double vision. He writes, either one looks and then looks again at what was hidden or forgotten, or one looks at a view while remembering another <coughs> So I titled this panel Double Visions of Landscape precisely because all of you, in some way, use double vision or a comparative gaze within your work to expose the impossibility of neutral landscape. Whether it's through tracing a specific site as it, as it appears in different scenes, as you do in your work, um, Noah, or using erasure as a means of exposing political realities which would otherwise remain hidden from view, as you do, Meir, or Fatma, how you playfully displace a symbol from interior to exterior as a means to engage a more personal experience. So in all three cases, um, landscape is not merely a depiction, but it becomes a medium through which to challenge and explore a vast array of struggles. Um, so I'm gonna begin, I'm just gonna give some comments and questions for each person and then we can discuss. Um, so Noah, you trace the symbol of the Temple Mount, Haram al-Sharif, as it moves between early European photography to the contemporary world of online tourism and advertising. Yet you do more than just compare one scene with another. 
Instead, you consider the complex web of institutional power and capital that drives the production of these images, not only as a means to generate a certain mythology of place, but also as a means to expand the colonial project in a very material way. Um, I'm wondering, first of all, if you can discuss um, the process of this project and of gathering all of these different images, um, where you found them, the different archives, and the politics of archives in Israel, generally, where these images are found. Um, second, although the focus of your project is the image of the dome, as it has been utilized and manipulated by colonial and Zionist interests, um, I wonder if you can also comment on some of the other sites in which it shows up for completely different ideological purposes, um, whether it be a photo hung in the living room of a Palestinian family as a symbol of longing and a desire for return, um, or the <coughs> thousands of photos that I, I just looked on Instagram and you know there's thousands of photos under the Dome of the Rock, um, which tourists you know, use this background themselves to define where they are and who they are. Um, or in a photojournalistic context, such as during the protests last summer over the imposition of metal detectors and restriction of access um, to Haram al-Sharif, and how these images of protests uh, with a dome usually in the background stand in contradiction to the Holy Land photos or these tourist images in which we see the area from a safe distance, um, seemingly devoid of human presence altogether. And this also raises questions about how these photos transmit notions of security as well, which is my research interest. Right. Um, and finally, I would love for you to hear more about this third temple movement, um, religious Zionists who hope to build the third temple at the same site. Um, I've seen also models and holograms used, and I wonder how this kind of future um, futuristic medium is different or serves a different purpose than the photographic medium. Um, and Meir, your project demonstrates the usefulness of erasure or camouflage as a form of decolonizing the visual field, much like the film we saw last night. Um, Israel invests in making the militarized formation of its society as invisible as possible, what Gil Hochberg has described as concealment, whereby not only Palestinians are made invisible to Israeli eyes, but the very process of concealment is also made invisible. And the same can be said of militarism, which structures civil life in Israel, including the construction of space. Um, and ironically, by marking military sites with these big white blots, the military censor draws attention to their very existence, and they become public secrets. Um, what makes your project so compelling is your method of reproducing a militarized aesthetic in order to expose another type of concealment that is the complicity of cultural and artistic institutions with the military and security establishments. Um, and by military aesthetics, I mean your use of redaction and aerial photography, which is largely associated with the proliferation of drone warfare and overhead surveillance. Um, I'm also thinking of just the words black sites, you know, in the contemporary so-called war on terror, mm -hmm. and even the image of redacted um, documents, such as redacted CIA reports on torture, where um, nouns, verbs, objects are <coughs> blacked out and kind of take on a different aesthetic of their own. Um, and when we look at these aerial photos, the entire landscape that surrounds the erased museums, every road, every home in the photo, can also be seen as touched, shaped, and represented in some way by military forces and activity. Um, so I wonder if you could elaborate on the connection between art institutions and militarism. Um, I'm also curious as to whether you displayed these works in a museum, um, and if so, can you talk about the dynamics of including this project in a space of which the project itself is so critical and audience reception to it? Um, and finally, I, you told me that you reproduced this project in New York City. So I would love to hear about um, the experience of that and how it differed um, or was, you know, similarities in contexts, um, especially here in New York where art institutions are similarly tied to political and corporate establishments. Um, recently, the Brooklyn Museum had to say something about their Saudi ties. Um, so it's very, you know, important. And speaking of the entanglement of art and colonial structures, we can now turn towards the work of Fatima and think about how the carpet has largely been associated with the exoticism of the East and the symbol of wealth and opulence for European or um, 
collectors during the Renaissance and today, um, and how through colonial roots the carpet has always traveled, um, so to speak, whether in its material form or through popular representations in Orient Orientalist paintings um, in the 19th century. Um, Fatma, although you consider the carpet to be a symbol of restraint in the home, um, especially in regards to gender, I wonder if by painting this symbol you also reclaim a personal, familial, or community connection to it, which may also be seen as empowering in some way. Um, I'm curious as to whether you view the carpet not only as a space of control, but also of um, local storytelling. I know that many of the designs in a carpet are specific to a county, village, or district um, where it was woven. And I wonder if the same is true of the Druze community of which you are a part. Um, and through your paintings, do you take the actual design of the carpet into consideration? Um, your project reminds me of the work of art historian James Elkins, who defines landscape as something we inhabit without being different from it. We are in it and we are it. Um, I find it fascinating to think of the carpet as having a personality of its own, whether it represents a self-portrait or a more general um, female spirit. In either case, the carpet, as the protagonist of your painting, um, becomes a part of the landscape and forgoes its original function, as you mentioned. Um, I was hoping that you can expand on how the image of the carpet within the home is different or is somehow transformed when you place it in an outdoor landscape setting. Um, and finally, I want to comment on the usefulness of Foucault's concept of heterotopia in the title of your presentation. Um, heterotopia being physical or mental spaces defined by a clear border um, within which there is a suspension of the norms of every day. Um, so he defines, for example, gardens, prisons, cemeteries, and brothels as types of heterotopic spaces. Um, and he gives the example of a boat, a floating piece of space, a place without a place that exists by itself, that is self-enclosed and at the same time is given over to the infinity of the sea. And this is how I picture the carpet in your paintings, as an enclosed rectangle floating over an expansive landscape, absorbing all of the you know, bumps and smells and soil beneath it. Um, and so while your work differs, I think, from the other two presentations, and that it focuses more on your personal experience at a more individual and communal level, I think it helps us think through questions of individual versus collective when it comes to the visual politics of seeing landscape. Um, so perhaps, you know, any of you can speak about that as well. Thank you. Those are my comments. Thank you, Shimui. I'll, I'll, I'll do it short. And actually, I'm interested in the um, communal versus the personal. So I'll, <laughs> I'll continue from, from here, because while working on um, the archival materials of the Dome of the Rock from um, the perspective of the state, or the perspective of the army, or the perspective of uh, the American Colony Department, uh, photographers, I kind of used to the, um, the image from above and from a safe distance, and they kind of adapted um, this way of seeing as the neutral way of seeing, and the neutral, neutral way of um, um, connecting to this holy landscape of Jerusalem. And um, I remember once, um, walking in a Palestinian friend's house and seeing many photos of the Dome of the Rock in a kind of a selfie mode of, um, uh, mode of I'd say, um, capturing the Dome of the Rock with the men from a fr up front watching the photographer while the Dome of the Rock in the background. So then I realized that it's like a completely different way of perceiving the dome than what we're used to as Israelis, as the, yeah, the dominant, um, dominant way of seeing. So it was a very meaningful moment for me to, to realize how we're used to something, but it's not the only way of presenting it. 
And do you, can you say more about the Third Temple movement and how they use visual means to get their message across? Um, yeah, so what's going on today, during the last year, I get more and more um, images of the skyline of the Dome of the Rock without the dome, mm -hmm. uh, without the dome actually. And we realize that it's, it's kind of a pattern of many groups of, um, I don't know how to, to describe them or define them, of um, radical um, religious Zionist group, or we, we can also describe them as the temple, um, just the, uh, the temple groups that erase Templars. the dome from what? Templars. Templars. <laughs> that erase the dome from the landscape of Jerusalem. And we got some very awkward official documents without the dome. For example, last year, a Passover Haggadah was distributed in many Israeli uh, schools and high schools in Tel Aviv without, like, with the landscape of, of Jerusalem without the dome. And last year, uh, actually last summer, the, um, the Jerusalem, um, I don't know how they call it, like a tourist office of Jerusalem distributed a, a, a tourist guide called Chill Out in Jerusalem without any, um, without uh, telling anything about the Dome of the Rock, nothing, not, a, not about non-verbal nor, uh, um, verbal nor visual uh, image of the Dome. Um, so it's a dangerous, I don't know, dangerous situation that we're trying to, to understand. And I, I think it's part of when I'm trying to um, understand it, I think since the dome is um, the main political symbol <coughs> of the Palestinian claim for self-determination, erasing um, erasing the dome from Israeli documents is, is kind of, I don't know, the same, the same process mm. of politicized, yeah. you know, political genocide, a uh, visual political genocide mm -hmm. of the dome. It's interesting just how visual means can be aspirational and futuring. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely, and. Um, you and I need to talk more often. Um, we're neighbors and we don't talk. I don't know why that is. But um, in, um, <clears throat> I see your point very clearly. Uh, and it's interesting what uh, visual, the visual additions that were put in by Israelis, right, after 48, and then much more so after 67, uh, really uh, changed the perception of the Israeli public towards space that once was Palestinian. Mm -hmm. right? So um, I remember uh, back in '94, I was uh, I was visiting in in Israel. I was already here for a few years, and uh, I came in '86, settled over here, and then I would do my research here and in Europe, and in Palestine, and in Israel. And on one of my trips in 94, I realized that I was going to miss my flight. And I was basically too busy, and uh, realized that I was going to miss my flight, and uh, decided to get in touch with the travel agent who was responsible for issuing the ticket. As some of you know, Israel is very informal. So if, even after business hours, you can go to the agent and talk to them on the phone. And so she told me to come to her home and pick up the new tickets, which I was very grateful for. But what happened that evening changed my entire thinking altogether. Uh, she told me to travel to a place called Pisgat Zev, which is a, uh, anybody knows Pisgat Zev, right? Yeah, 
It's a it's a Jewish settlement. I would say 20 minutes uh, north of, of uh, Jerusalem, and so I went there in the evening, and she was she was living in Rehova Tayas, which in English means the street of the pilot or the pilot street, which uh, initially I didn't pay much attention to. But when I finally left Jerusalem and drove for about 15, 20 minutes through various Palestinian villages, and I got to Pisgah Zev, I realized that I didn't know where to go. So I stopped by a bus stop and asked, uh, where, where is the Pilot Street? And they said, oh, it's quite near. Go down the Jerusalem Platoon Street. Okay. Make a right on Infantry Street. <laughs> You'll arrive at a junction that is the Shaked Elite Unit. Go around the whole thing. Make a right on Commando Street. <laughs> and the Pilot Street is going to be the second one on your left. Right? And yes, I found her. But then immediately booked my next trip. And for two years, I basically spent my time in that settlement documenting how the, the Israelis, first of all, erased the Palestinian village that was there by Hanina. Anybody from there? Right? And basically split the Hanina into two parts on both sides of the highway that the Israelis had built. And instead of the, the Palestinian houses that were there, these, uh, that were first erased, the Israelis built the new buildings that Kamal, you show in your film yesterday. Uh, some of them were villas with those red roofs. Some of them were six and eight story buildings with luxury apartments, which is how, um, which is how the Israeli public was lured into the West Bank. As you might know, prices of real estate in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv are quite high. In some places, they are as high as Brooklyn and New York. And most of the Israeli public does not and cannot afford buying a two or three bedroom apartment in the center of Jerusalem or the suburbs. So these settlements, uh, were marketed quite ingeniously by the Israeli government as a place just outside Jerusalem, heavily subsidized. In other words, as an Israeli family of six, you were able to buy an apartment 15 minutes from Jerusalem, four bedrooms, luxurious, with endless views of Palestine. And so Israelis moved, and they're there. And if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, there are close to 500 or 600,000 Israeli settlers in the West Bank. But it started way back in 1967. So mainly Mizrahi. Mainly Mizrahi, yeah. And somebody in the conference yesterday, somebody at your uh, screening, asked about the relationship between Mizrahi Jews and Arabs and why Mizrahi Jews uh, hate Arabs so much, and I hope somebody will ask that question because I think that question needs to be revisited. Um, so what I did was I photographed the names of the streets. You know, the Pilot Street, the Commando Street, and then during uh, during a few nights, I actually stole the street signs themselves. So right now I have a collection of about 60 street signs. Don't tell anybody. And, and um, I put together an installation in Tel Aviv uh, with all the street names and the names of, this, of the Palestinian street that were there prior to the occupation. Okay. So it goes back to, to what you were saying 
uh, how within a decade of settling these areas, the Israelis who were living in those settlements didn't have a clue as to the Palestinians who were living there uh, before. Right. It's like two levels of erasure. Um, the second one being civil militarism. And, and the second being cultural. And not only that, the, the, the completely warped element that was introduced into my research was that within this new community of Israelis, they arranged the social structure in those settlements according to the hierarchy imposed by the military. In other words, if you lived on Air Force streets, you were the best family in the neighborhood. In other words, they copied the hierarchy from the military and superimposed it on social certification within the settlement. I want to just move on, just so Fatma can say something, and we can open it up um, to audience Q and A. Yeah, can maybe Doc uh, <coughs> do a video work? Like it's only draft for now because I didn't use it or I didn't make really a video or work, but it's only a draft. It's a video that I took about a few months ago, about yeah, or about years ago, year ago, at the Central Park. I directed a carpet. Um, in the center of some root and with a video uh, camera and I wanted to see or uh, in how people react to the carpet um, and most of the people just walked around the carpet and they didn't st step on the carpet and I was wondering why they did that like um, even most of the people um, doesn't don't have a carpet on their home, but the memory of the carpet from maybe from the Middle East or from other places in the world affected on their way how they you know, um, react to the carpet. Or, um, <coughs> so yeah, right. you talk yeah. about in your work how the carpet is kind of a restricted area, and yeah. you've learned to you know walk around it. Yeah. yeah, but how you know the memory effect on your way that you change your route or uh, really could collide your route or uh, change your movement, the, the movement of the body, mm -hmm. even, yeah. That's awesome. um, does anyone have any questions? Well, not so much a question, but like the temperament <coughs> people are also crazy. They're like the militias of underground militia people and they're and it's a small group and they get an enormous amount of attention because they're crazy and they stick out. Um, I haven't seen the chill out Jerusalem um, that doesn't have the uh, the does it have Hala, but the rest of Halabite? Does it have the rest oh, of Oh totally it? yeah does it? because generally there's also a really crazy ad now with two half naked ladies Cavorting through as if they're walking oh. around the old city, as if you walk there because there's an enormous effort to paint right. Israel as a fun place to be, right. as opposed to your grandmother's history and footsteps of Jesus mm -hmm. and whatever. So there's an effort to do startup nation and beach and food. Now they so I just wonder if that's if this chill out Jerusalem is. So the, the radical um, versions of these um, erasing is superimposing the, the third temple instead of the Dome of the Rock. And there are plenty of images that are, we're, we're just starting to realize that there is a pattern here of erasing and superimposing the, a model of uh, the third temple in the landscape uh, instead of the Dome of the Rock. So, and that's a government issue thing? Um, no, this is, but you know, the no, Temple Institute, right the Temple Institute and the Temple right. movements are gaining more and more legitimation and support in Israel. So, um, they, they <coughs> mainly, unfortunately, get to do what they want. Um, about the rug, do you think people were not stepping on it maybe because it was too pretty? They didn't want to uh, besmirch it, you know? They were respecting it. Is that possible? Um, no, because...
because I um, asked them why you didn't stop step on the carpet, and they, the answer was because you know their memory just yeah. was there. <laughs> this is the main reason. Yeah. 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 The memory of what? Of uh, you know that you can't walk on the carpet. That you can you can you have to keep it steady, clean, and uh, it has to be. Uh, Yeah. <laughs> Why is it sacred? Why can't you walk on a carpet? <coughs> and or can you just take off your shoes and then walk on the carpet, or do you have to walk around it? Um, it depends you know, from where you are or from village you are. Or, mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know, here I'm just talking, it's not the carpet, it's the way that um, your body and the way or the place that you can or cannot, mm -hmm. your body, you know, um, mm -hmm. where your body can be and where it cannot be. Mm -hmm. And um, this, is, you know, this is the issue. Yeah. Uh, Jim? Uh, thank you guys for some really fantastic uh, presentations. I was so I was something she reads in her uh, commentary about futuring the landscape by erasing uh, or superimposing things on top of it. Uh, and that that's fascinating to me because you know the the, the political intent of erasing a place like the Dome of the Rock from the landscape initially suggests that you know or it, the implicit suggestion there is that this has been a particular type of space since time immemorial. Like it, 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 it's sort of like reaching back into the past or trying to <coughs> erase a past that is, is not desired. Uh, but it's also by superimposing new uh, you know, um, architecture or new uh, buildings or new people uh, on, on top of these images, it, it, is, it is futuristic as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't, I wonder how conscious that engagement with with futurism mm -hmm. as a movement, which is you know, Italian, it's fascist, uh, mm -hmm. you know, how conscious that connection really is. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, whether that's something, you know, that's been Im Im imbibed, uh, you know, just through the general state culture, or if that's something that's maybe a little bit more explicitly drawn from, from futurism as a movement. Is that, is that a... Question for all of us. So, uh, she okay. <laughs> well, uh, do you want to say something or? I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by the um, perspective. Um, I'll think about it. I can just basically say that, uh, and, and take it for a comment, that um, I think there is a very strong relationship there. Um, and there is a, uh, everything that they're doing now is for the sake of a certain future that people in Israel would like to have. So alongside the, the visual cleansing and the, the territorial cleansing that is going on, uh, you know, in Palestine, there's also what we call creeping ethnic cleansing. Uh, just, uh, uh, you know, as an aside, I'm in the process of uh, building a new home, and you know, and along the way, you meet people that you never expected you would meet. So one evening, I met IKEA buying kitchen cabinetry, and of course, I bought too much uh, that my car could hold. And two, it was nine o'clock in the evening, and two gentlemen approached me and asked me, do you need help? And I said, yes, I do need help. They'll say, and then they said, well, for $200, we'll take anything that you have, and we'll take it to your location, we'll, up, we'll unload it, we'll help you bring it to, to where it needs to go. And then, you know, it's like, you speak Arabic, you speak Arabic. It turns out that we all speak Arabic. And uh, so we switched to Arabic. And um, and it was a great it was a great evening because they told me to come with them so I sat with them in the cabin and during the 20 minute ride <coughs> this this amazing guy Nasser told me that 
the Israelis kicked him out eight, 18 years ago. He wanted to go and visit family abroad. He went and was never allowed to come back, which is what the Israelis do, by the way. Okay, they tell you to, you can travel, and then when you try to enter, you can't. Right? So, they um, basically expelled him again. Uh, the first expulsion in 48, second expulsion in his own uh, lifetime, about 18 years ago, and uh, came to the States, was allowed entry, but then was jailed for five years for not having a passport. Because he doesn't have a Palestinian passport, he doesn't have an American passport. So basically he lives here day by day without a country, without a passport, without anywhere to go. And I'm telling that story now is because uh, Israel has been doing gradual but very systematic ethnic cleansing in which not only do they destroy homes on a regular basis, and I hope that you follow that aspect of the occupation, um, but they also gradually and systematically minimize the numbers of Palestinians in Palestine. I don't know if you want to add to that. I just wanted to um, also respond to your question. Um, I just mentioned the plethora of museums in Jerusalem as well, many devoted to the idea of the Third Temple, um, where you can experience um, like 3D models. Um, I also went to like an, the, like an evangelical <laughs> museum where it was so digital, it was a digital experience basically, and there were lots of holograms um, and rooms that were just changing screens. And so, I mean, this is just another question you can think of is beyond the, the photo, you know, how else um, are, is a future being imagined? And many of that is experiential, you know, like kind of bodily, physical experiences. Um, very futuristic, uh, maybe tied to like the startup nation tech obsession, but also it's, you know, it's more powerful than a photo to be, to oh, see an actual model before you. Yeah, we have time for maybe a couple more questions. Um, Dotan and then Fidel. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. All very interesting. I wanted to ask Padma whether, first, I mean, the, the paintings are phenomenal. I was, uh, I, actually, I thought it's pictures, but then I mean, I saw them. It's all kind of totally phenomenal. I wanted to ask about the, um, where the carpet is in the field, whether the two um, um, figures there, are they spreading? It's both. It's both. Yeah. <laughs> like Great. I'm, uh, no, just, I, I think it's, um, I'm thinking about, you know, hiding things behind the carpet and these kind of things, and also your earlier work about the carpet basically hang in the air, um, kind of corresponds with the movie yesterday. It's, I mean, basically, right, um, just covering whatever, uh, so, I, so I wonder if there's anything that the park is basically covering. Uh, just a very quick note for Noah. Um, I, think, I think it's just an fascinating to see how, I mean, this, um, I mean, and, and what Shemit has mentioned about the, about the temple, um, this uh, temple movements. I mean, um, it's it fascinating to see how this undermines um, the Western world, which with great effort was sort of established post 67 as the most important side combining right, national and religious identity. Um, and, um, and, and, and I wonder what, 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 that, what this means to what the, the place of, of the Western world. It's a site which is not so important or attractive. I mean, tourist-wise, right? But it is still within Israeli society. I mean, still, I mean, we amplify here the aspects of the, of, 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 of and, and the third, but, but still, within Israeli society, the consensus is that the Western world is the site to visit. Most people visit the Western world, not, not the um, So I wonder how these, I mean, sort of the relations between these spaces. Uh, <coughs> 
So I'll try to answer both questions, both comments. Um, do you want to start? Yes. Oh. <laughs> um, mainly because of yesterday's screening, I keep thinking about uh, mental cartography <laughs> and about how, you know, we talked about it earlier that during the last uh, decade, maybe we're talking about um, the archival turn and how to decolonize the gays and I keep um, getting questions about the validity of uh, the new archives that we're trying to build out of the um, by opening the like the by opening the institutional archive and by trying to um, re-narrate the history from these archives. And last night after the, the screening, I was um, very impressed by the, I, I got a sense of a strong, um, real, realistic feeling after the shooting because by erasing, I mean, maybe by erasing the actors and um, projecting only the real people um, in the shootings, I suddenly got uh, the answer that I was looking for uh, regarding the validity of um, uh, the act of decolonization, the validity of the new archives that we're trying to um, to build, and maybe the the mental cartography of the people around that walks around that walk around the carpet, and the mental cartography that um, these temple movements are trying to superimpose on the landscape itself is something that we can um, relate to this, or maybe it's only in my, in my, in my mind. It works. <laughs> <laughs> or <laughs> that we can uh, think about together as two sides of the same, um, um, the same effort to decolonize or to uh, open visual colonial archives and to rethink about them. Yeah, uh, first of all, I can say that my work based, like, I'm a painter. I, I stay most of the, my time at the studio, but the process before I start to paint is really go and stage scenes. All of the scenes are stage. And because uh, for me, using my body and, and, um, uh, it's sort of, I can like say, a personal um, performance because I do a performance but without audience. Like it's only me and the carpet and the girls. And, um, and you talked about covering the landscape or uh, covering the, you know, the view. Um, it's like for me, the carpet is the individual, represent the individual, and the landscape or the village is the larger place. And so I'm trying to add the carpet or add the individual within the place. Uh, it's on it's all these questions about relationships between between. between the body and the carpet or the carpet and the landscape or mm -hmm. yeah. um, Fidel, we also have Professor Mitchell. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, thank you all of you guys. I'm like, lost in thought in so many different levels. Well, my, my, my question comes from ignorance of the Israeli society in particular. And, and when you, know, you were talking about the uh, settlements, I wanted to ask when, when I say the settler, in my mind, it has a very political turn because yeah. it could be 
extremely negative is someone occupying someone's land, or it can be really positive, like pioneers pushing through uh, new lands and you know getting what's rightfully theirs. Did you feel through your experience of two years documenting the street roads, people kind of trying to reconcile the struggle between being mm -hmm. that or that? Or did you feel like, <coughs> you know, like it's, it's, it's an economic incentive and I have to think about my family and not what political uh, ramifications it can have in the future? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, uh, spending two years' time there, taught me a lot about uh, Israeli society. Um, Personally, I did not encounter anyone who tried to <coughs> reconcile between the financial and the political. Um, which bring, which uh, brings me to say uh, that the situation is far worse than I had expected. In other words, there was n there was no awareness whatsoever that. These are the occupied territories, right? And that by moving from Jerusalem proper to um, north of Jerusalem and to settlements near Shu'afat, <coughs> near um, Ramallah, uh, did not constitute a, a violation of any agreement or the rights of any people, and that. Uh, that goes back to what I was saying earlier, that when I started my decade-long project, Imitate the State, this is exactly what I'm talking about. The State of Israel has been so affected in completely whitewashing and transforming the history of the entire region so that any action within the land, within the space, and you know, I love your, your project, it's, it's so important, right? Is not only justified, not only is it legal, but it also corrects an aberration that happened in history that allowed the Palestinians to occupy the land for a certain period of time. In other words, it's a correction of history. So there was no remorse, there was no hesitation, on the contrary, they saw themselves as almost like biblical pioneers within modern day uh, Israel who were reclaiming land that because of circumstances belonged to Palestinians temporarily. And just to that point, and also Dotan's point about the Western Wall, um, Noah, you say there's kind of a, a move towards a militarized gaze post-67, um, but yet I'm thinking of that very iconic photo <coughs> of um, David Rubinger, um, of the three, uh, <coughs> Soldiers. the three Israeli paratroopers gazing at the Western Wall yeah. um, with their army helmets on them, and so there really is still this element of religious redemption, um, which yeah. is kind of intertwined with this, uh, with the military victory as well, yeah. um, where the dome, you can't see it, but it's you know, right on the other side yeah. of the photograph. Don't forget to mention that the three men in the photograph are Ashkenazi Jews, a very good looking Ashkenazi Jews. So. <laughs> um, we also couldn't uh, walk back from the Western Wall because it was still the Mugrabi neighborhood there that mm. was demolished. Right. There after. was no plaza. It was no people's plaza. homes. Um, so again, you can see how the photo, you know, erases that reality as well. Mm -hmm. um, the victory photo, what it does not contain. Um, so one final question. Thank you all for staying a little bit later. I apologize for that, um, uh, Professor Mitchell. Yeah, uh, thank you. It's a terrific panel. I just wanted to follow up a bit on the, the question that was asked about uh, futurism and the future. Um, Actually, one thing that's revealed by this conversation is that uh, <coughs> future prospects, whether it's futurist, Italian futurism or any other kind, Afrofuturism, for instance, always involves a mythical past that has to be restored, and that we're, we're actually in a futurist moment in this country, mm -hmm. we're making America great again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're not just making it great, it's got to be, refer back to some golden age 
mm -hmm. that never existed, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, but the, the myth or fantasy is perpetrated as a way of justifying usually fairly extreme measures involving military force. So your, your wonderful project of uh, stealing the street signs uh, with the hierarchy of the army uh, yeah. inscribed in space. captures that. that the Army, uh, it, and of course Italian futurism was highly militaristic. Uh, it's all about the celebration of, of military power mm -hmm. to produce a new future. So uh, just a, you know, a thought. It's not really a question. I just you know, mm -hmm. wanted to express my appreciation of what you were saying. I don't know what to say about the carpets. Uh, they're so beautiful. Uh, I can understand why people would, be, would hesitate to, to walk on them. They're works of art. Mm -hmm. We are con conditioned not to touch. Yeah, yeah, yeah but you no, know, I, I like you know the artists from the Renaissance. They they took the carpet or they brought the carpet from the Middle East and they added you know they painted in order to represent uh, you know, um, knowledge or. Uh, 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 yeah. So. Uh, it's a different, um, different act. So I just uh, wanted to thank all of our amazing panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Lunch around twelve, just outside here, and then we'll hear from.